Good morning, everybody, and welcome to First Things First. Today is Tuesday, March 22nd. This is Simply Cyber's daily morning cybersecurity threat briefing. I'm your host, Gerald Dozier. In the next 30 minutes, we are going to deliver the top cybersecurity news, and I will provide expert analysis on each story on what it means to you as a practitioner or folks looking to break into the industry. If you are live, love it. Let me see what's going on. Good morning. Good morning. Absolutely love it. Thanks for catching the stream. If you want to jump right to the news because you're watching it on replay, that ticker in the corner is going to go to zero, and then we're going to start the show. But until then, we're welcoming people, letting people get in here and say what's up. So thank you. Uh, but for the yeah, so for the next minute and fifty three seconds, let's welcome folks into the stream. Let me do that. I'm dealing with all sorts of new stuff here, guys. Special shout out to Eric Taylor. I hope you guys enjoyed Eric's. Um, covering the stream yesterday. I genuinely appreciate it. Um, I, you know, guys, we are doing, um, a hundred plus days now of, of the stream and I didn't want to miss a beat. And Eric was more than willing to help out. So thank you so much. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Peter Parker. Cracking me up. I will tell you guys, I, you know, you saw me in chat, um, uh, yesterday on the stream. I, my wife, my wife, Mrs. Dr. Osher was listening. She said, I like the way Eric talks. He's he's much more mellow and chill. Like you're you're always amped up and way too much coffee for that early in the morning. So Eric, if you're with us right now, uh, I just wanted to let you know my wife prefers your first things first. By the way, speaking of Eric, I want to remind you guys that first things first is sponsored by Barricade Cyber Solutions, your partner for incident response, ransomware protection, and business recovery. Thank you so much to Barricade Cyber Solutions. And as Eric outlined yesterday, you could see this is where he operates. This is where he lives all up in ransomware's face. Hey, Base, good to see you always. Pierre Brown, nice to see you. Special shout out to Tom Pike. Find an emotet. Way to go, Tom. Crushing it in his new role. Let's see. Yeah, I, I don't think if I didn't have the support of my wife, I'd be able to do half the things I've done in my life. Uh, very, very fortunate to have found a partner who is more than willing to <laughs> allow me to pursue all of the insanity that I do uh, pursue. Guys, a couple of things really quick, just so you know, we got five seconds. Got a bigger lens right now. So when I'm wearing Black Hills or Simply Cyber gear, you're going to see it, right? My key light isn't working, which is why it looks like I'm a red teamer lurking in the shadows, uh, but we're, we're going to get it sorted out. Um, so hopefully you appreciate, um, you know, grant me some grace for the different look and feel. I'm always open to feedback. I did get um, a comment from a listener saying that my thumbnail for first things first uh, could be improved for clickability. So I'll be looking in that, maybe talking to my, my, my marketing uh, POC, see if Kimberly's got any ideas, but guys, Let's jump into it right now. Hey, Jess, Ben. And for those of you taking the GRC Analyst Masterclass, thank you so much. Wanted to give you guys a quick update, and then we're going to get into the story. 1,700 people have signed up for the school. 1,200 plus are actively taking the GRC class right now. I've seen tons of certificates of completions come through on social media. I'm very happy for all of you for completing it. For those of you who are in the 1,200 that are taking it but haven't finished it, I hope you're enjoying it. I hope it's bringing value. I am, you know, obviously super biased about the course, but I think it's fantastic. So, but enough about the course. Let's dive into the stories of the day. If you want to play along, guys, we go to sissoseries.com, sissoseries.com, and that's where we get our news. So let's dive into it and have a good time. Thank you for being here. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. Ransomware puts the brakes on Bridgestone. The tire manufacturer said that a February 27th cyber attack resulted in it shutting down its network and production facilities in the Americas for one week. An investigation later revealed this to be an attempted ransomware attack. It's unclear who was behind the attack or the ransom demands entailed. This comes after several weeks of increased cyber attacks on the automotive supply chain, with the Toyota supplier Denso hit by a ransomware attack two weeks ago, and Toyota itself hit with an attack in late February that shut down domestic production for a day. Yeah, so, okay, um, we talked about this 
last week, the Bridgestone getting hit. Um, apparently it was a ransomware attack, like big surprise shocker. This is, I mean, it sucks for Bridgestone. It is newsworthy in the case that Bridgestone is a massive tire manufacturer globally, but you know, ransomware is going to ransomware. I find it interesting that the automotive manufacturing industry is being targeted more in the last couple of weeks than I've really seen it. Now, manufacturing does lead the, the pack as far as what industry is most targeted by ransomware, but it doesn't typically get into the subsets of which manufacturing. So <clears throat> definitely an uptick in automotive. I do have friends who are <clears throat> leading information security programs at automotive manufacturing uh, companies. Definitely going to notify them or they should be watching. Um, but if you work in manufacturing, be aware if you are in automotive manufacturing, you should definitely have um, shields up or your your risk profile, right? Your your likelihood of impact or your likelihood of compromise should be going up in your threat modeling. Uh, and that's all I'll say on that. Fishing with a browser in a browser attack. A security researcher known as Mr. Docs outlined this new <coughs> novel phishing attack, which simulates a browser window in a browser to spoof a legitimate domain. This aims to replicate the entire single sign-on process used for things like sign-in with Google or similar services and provides a pop-up window for users to fill in their credentials. In a technical write-up on the process, the researcher said this could be basically indistinguishable for users, warning that even if users find themselves on a malicious website, it would be easy to socially engineer them to complete the sign-in if it seemed to come from a trusted company. Yeah. All right, guys. So this is going to be an issue. And really quick, Ultra 7 H128 starting a new sock job. Give that some love. Congratulations on that. I'm super happy for you. Guys, br <clears throat> browser in the browser attack. Okay, couple couple things going on here that's worth noting. One, I know you see it all the time. Single sign-on is really an awesome concept, right? So you have have one account and you can use it to log into multiple um, applications, right? Essentially, you have to remember one username and password. It's got to be a good one and you should have multi-factor, but it's a single source, right? And if you are a business, it's wicked nice because when you terminate an employee, you cut off their access to that one account and it shuts it off across all the cloud systems. So there's definitely a nice value to it. Now, we see it all the time. Sign in with Google, sign in with Microsoft, sign in with Amazon. And it allows you to leverage these accounts. And I love it. But bad guys are now doing this attack where they simulate that pop-up of the, the Google account sign-in, making it look virtually identical. Now, browser in the browser is an interesting attack, okay? Because people are going to continue to use single sign-on. So it's definitely an increasing um, opportunity for threat actors. Now, here's the thing. When we... When we talk about man in the middle attacks, when we talk about man in the middle attacks, you know, you've got your endpoint and you've got your sir, and you're trying to get in the middle of the network traffic, right? And you're, you're either um, sniffing it or you're changing it, right? So you're compromising the confidentiality and or the integrity of that with neither party really being aware that the compromise has occurred. With encryption though, the man in the middle attack is kind of... Uh, it's not completely addressed, but it does hamper the ability to sniff those packets because they're encrypted. The data, the layer seven, six, and five are encrypted. With browser in the browser attack, the attack is happening more, like up in the layer seven of that OSI stack where the, th the, the victim is typing it into a browser sans encryption because it's literally at the at the browser level, and it's going definitely to the threat actor. And the threat actor, I don't know if it said it in the story, but they're able to relay the creds down into the uh, the actual Google um, sign-in. So the victim successfully logs in, continues about their business, unaware that they have been compromised in giving their creds and possibly the multi-factor authentication token. And I love these one-time pins that rotate, but the thing is if the threat actor is actively waiting, if they have it set up to alert them through like a web hook or something, that one-time password or one-time pin or whatever, as far as I know, is still valid for that 30 second period. So they can log in quickly. Correct me if I'm wrong, chat. If it's, I know it's called one-time pin, but I think if you use it again in that 30 second window, it's good. If not, then that's awesome. And that'll work entirely. But this is an interesting attack. 
I don't know how pervasive it is as far as ease of deployment. If I almost think you have to have compromised the browser already of the victim in order to get this to pop up because they are going to a legitimate site and logging in with you know Google or whatever, and that's popping up, right? So it's not like you're doing a phishing hole attack where you've got a fake domain that looks legit and you're popping up. Um, or maybe it's both. Either way. Conti leaks, leaks Conti code. Last month, the security researcher going by Conti leaks uploaded chat logs and older source code belonging to the Conti ransomware group in response to the group's expression of support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. While useful for researchers to understand the group, the source code had limited utility as it was several years old and no longer used by Conti on current victims. Over the weekend, Conti leaks uploaded source code for Conti version 3 to Virus Total, about a year newer than the last leak, last modified in January 2021. Yeah, so, you know, the Conti, this is the ransomware group that um, publicly uh, announced support for Russia. And then members of the Conti group, uh, allegedly Ukrainian members of the Conti group, um, basically released internal communications chat. It looks like now they're releasing source code of the actual um, malware. Again, a lot of this malware has been reversed. So we do have TTPs and indicators of compromise and stuff like that. Uh, it's interesting, but it, I guess it's, it's interesting to see kind of a conflict of a threat actor group playing out in the public space with all of this um, leaks, if you will. If you're interested in following it, the Twitter account is Conti, at Conti Leaks. Uh, if you want to do that, I haven't had a chance personally to look at any of the communication stuff. I know that... Um, Brian Krebs is supposed to be doing a analysis of all the communication stuff and then a debrief uh, publicly. I'm not sure if that has happened. I'm, whoops. I'm, I'm wondering if anyone in chat is aware that this has happened and if they've read it. I'll go back and look at chat. But yeah, I'm definitely curious. Let's see, Conti. Not to do this on the fly, but yeah, the word continue. There we go. Yes. Okay. So yeah, look at, look at, he's got a four part series already. I'm going to dig into this. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious. Stay tuned on LinkedIn or something. <laughs> I'm going to comment on this. This is pretty awesome. FTC accuses cafe press of covering up a data breach. Oh, the again, Federal trade commission filed a complaint against the current and former owners of cafe press saying the company failed to implement reasonable security controls to protect sensitive data. The complaint specifically said the site stored social security numbers in plain text, failed to protect encrypted passwords for buyers and sellers and stored data longer than was necessary. An investigation into the company's security practices found multiple breaches with a February 2019 attack exfiltrating millions of email addresses, passwords with weak encryption, and social security numbers. A proposed settlement would see the site's former owners pay $500,000 to redress damages and require its current owners to alert customers. Okay, so Cafe Press is one of these uh, groups that basically... Um, got data breached and they were storing data in a really silly way. Uh, and now the FTC is slapping the wrist. I've gone to the cafe press website. I'm really curious, like, listen, in my experience, and I'm curious, you know, Chad, if you've got experience in this, in my experience, I have dealt with certain developers who <laughs> they don't implement best practices. They're super focused on delivering product to market right? They're not thinking of not only just security, but just like best practices on data storage. It's like, okay, create the, create the text fields, ingest them into a database, do something with it, right? Go, go, go. Oftentimes, and the reason I've gone to the Cafe Press website is because I'm actually curious. I want to know, I bet you, if I had to guess, they actually have a small dev group or they've outsourced dev to a team and given them exclusively requirements that deliver the product to their uh, customers and that's it. Like I, I have a feeling that they were running super lean and super fast and really didn't take into consideration these type of things. Um, it very, if you like software in like the, the early two thousands, like was rife with this stuff. And then security became a thing. We started baking security in. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. I I'm kind of curious, honestly, what they're, what they're about us is. I'd have to go back. It says 99 to 2022, which sounds like they've been around a while, but you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. 
I disagree. And now a word from our sponsor, nope. Veronis. What saying terminals were on their way? At the time, it was unclear how widespread the service would be in Ukraine and how oh, many sorry guys. would be available. Washington Post. In an interview with the Washington Post this week, Ukraine's Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, said the country already received thousands of SpaceX Starlink satellite internet terminals, calling the service very effective. The Post sources say over 5,000 terminals are now in the country, coming from the supplies of other European countries. Okay, I can't read this story. Um Maybe, you know, obviously let's, let's nerd it out guys. Sorry. Do, 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 do. All right. Uh, the whole story isn't here. I was hoping I might be able to cheat. Um, it sounds like uh, the Starlink, this isn't really a cybersecurity story, right? It sounds like the Starlink terminals, which are required in order to be able to connect to the Starlink uh, satellite network system uh, in order to get network access to the internet um, they were successfully delivered. I don't know how they did it. Um, they definitely had to truck them in. I saw a picture of a truck, uh, bringing those in. So it sounds like they're up and running and Ukraine is back, uh, with internet access for those who were cut off. Right. So whether through, um, military strikes or, you know, uh, technical in, in, in impedance on cutting off the network access, whatever, long story short, they've got access as a quick aside. I have heard that you're able to detect where the the terminals are thank you you are able to, to tell where the terminals are so that could be uh dangerous for those using those terminals uh but the good news is availability is a whole thing and it's it's start startlingly impressive that one man elon musk in this case can just give an entire country internet service like in a week. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, I'm not saying he's wielding like unbelievable power, like Thanos in the gauntlet or something, but it is impressive to be able to give internet service to an entire country when you decide to just like, this is something we're going to do. Let's do it. Meta labeled an extremist organization. A Moscow court banned Facebook and Instagram in Russia with the judge ruling the app's activities as extremist. While Russia's communication regulator Roskomnadzor already blocked access to the apps, the extremist designation opens the door to bringing criminal charges against Meta employees in Russia. Currently, there are no Meta employees in the country, but this designation could be used to target other tech companies still operating in Russia. Hmm. WhatsApp remains available in the country, although some government officials have called for a ban on Meta's messaging platform as well. Okay. So again, this isn't really a cybersecurity story. I mean, you could you could argue it's around availability, but basically Russia is saying Meta slash Facebook um, is guilty of extremist activity, so it's not allowed to stay. Um, WhatsApp can stay. As far as I know, WhatsApp is uh, China-based. Russia and China are allies. And you know, that might that might play into why WhatsApp is okay and Meta is not okay. Um, but, you know, essentially, this is around the control of information, if I had to guess, right? If a platform is widespread and it is spreading information that you as a controlling government or a, 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 it doesn't matter if it's authoritative, democratic, wh whatever, if the ruling party it, it wants to control information and information that is counter to the, the controlling party's goals and objectives is out there, they want to address it, right? So in order to, to maintain control. So th that's kind of what's going on here. Um, you know, I, I don't know if Facebook was used, like perhaps they were doing extremist activity, right? And maybe I'm incorrect, but it seems on the surface that that might be part of what's going on. Facebook was already banned, as we can see. So Meta's banned. I mean, Meta is just, I guess, going to be the VR world, which isn't fully stabilized at this point anyways as a practical uh, venue for conducting business or social interaction. Um, it is used a little bit, but not mainstream. So yeah, that's all I'll say about that. HubSpot hack impacts crypto companies. The marketing and sales platform HubSpot informed clients that a bad actor compromised an employee account leading to a data breach that focused on customers in the cryptocurrency industry. Circle, BlockFi, Pantera Capital, and NYDIG were among the crypto firms impacted by the breach. Pantera said that it used HubSpot as a CRM platform, 
with hackers able to access customer names, phone numbers, and regulatory classifications. It said that internal systems were not impacted and no social security numbers were accessed. HubSpot did not say how much data was stolen, only saying data was exported from fewer than 30 HubSpot portals. It's likely this data will be used in attempted phishing schemes. Oh, definitely. So HubSpot's a, a CRM platform. So think of like Salesforce or any of these platforms where you have leads, you have uh, customers, right? It, it's basically uh, like a, a glorified heavy duty Rolodex, right? Like these are all people that I can contact that are interested in my product. These are people that use my product. These are potential people that work. I buy a list from like Black Hat, right? If you ever go to Black Hat, you get your badge scanned by everybody. They're building a list that they're going to turn around and sell. That's what CRMs do. So, you know, for 30 HubSpot portals to be attacked, basically all of the data within those portals may have been compromised. They said no social security numbers, which makes sense because in reality, um, you don't typically collect that on leads and stuff like that, but you do collect username. I mean, first name, last name, email, potentially uh, location, industry, uh, role, whether you're CFO. So that type of data, as they mentioned in the story, this is part of the recon phase, right? So if we look at the cyber kill chain, and this is something that you should familiarize yourself with if you don't know this term. Right. I know it's kind of beat in our industry. People don't like it. But if you look at the cyber kill chain, let me just pull up a random image here. Right. If we look at the cyber here, if we look at the cyber kill chain, it goes left to right. And there is some um, uh, like once you do compromise part of it, you start looping around as you do lateral movement and et cetera. But for the most part, recon is the first step in an attack. Right. My pen testers, my red team people in chat, you know what I'm talking about. Showed in, uh, you know, physical surveillance, Google Maps, whatever, Facebook, right? You do your recon and you understand what your targets look like. And then you choose an appropriate weapon. Is it spear phishing? Is it um, USB drives dropped in the parking lot? What, like, what is your weapon in order to cause exploitation? And then you deliver that weapon. So for something like this, what I'm thinking is you buy this HubSpot list or you download, you download all these things. You get all, like the way I would do it if I was a threat actor, I would look at this. I would find all the CFOs. I would see what HubSpot uh, business that they were engaged with, right? Then I would either create a fake domain and say, hey, this is, you know, Jerry from whatever like group you thought you should be getting email from. Check out this Q2 prospect for 22 or we got a sick new product coming out and we want you to be a beta tester. You'll get it absolutely free. What, whatever the attack is, right? Fishes are going to fish, get it in there. Boom. You've already, the reason that fishes work sometimes is because you have trust. You have confidence. When you see an email come in from somebody that you have been working with or some organization that you've been working with, you're less likely to question it because it's familiar. It makes sense. This is why business email compromise attacks sit and wait and look for opportunity to jump into the stream of the communication and basically override it, right? They don't just blurt at you, hey, here's an invoice for 80 grand, pay it. Like, no, because you'd be like, why the hell is, what is this? No, they wait. So that's where this um, could happen. Unfortunately, with something like this, this attack right here, uh, you are likely, you are unlikely to find out of when these attacks happen because if it's like a midsize, manufacturing company and they get hit for 60k of business email compromise yeah it sucks for them they may not know that they originally got discovered as a potential groomed target from this breach and they're probably not going to report it except to their insurance company so the data will never come out unless it's a massive breach so unfortunately this stuff happens all the time and that's kind of this is part of that recon phase telegram in brazil temporarily banned the New York Times reports that Brazil lifted its ban on the messaging app Telegram after its Supreme Court blocked the app late last week. The app's reinstatement came after it made changes to combat misinformation. This includes removing classified information previously leaked by Brazil's president. Telegram also committed to labeling posts with false information, promoting factual sources, and monitoring Brazil's 100 most popular Telegram channels. Telegram CEO Pavel Durov said the company failed to comply with court demands for changes before the ban, saying it was monitoring the wrong email inbox and missing the court's message in time. 
Wow. That's a, <laughs> that's a funny excuse. Oh, uh, we were, we, you said it's in the wrong email address. We weren't looking for it. Okay. So Brazil, Brazil says, Hey, your, uh, the way you're delivering misinformation is a problem. We don't like it. Telegram said, Oh, we didn't get the email. So Brazil banned it and 1.1 million subscribers stopped using Telegram. Telegram immediately addressed it and, <laughs> and Brazil lifted it. So this is one of those ones where a country needed to impose its will. Hey, fix this. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll fix it. No big deal. And then Brazil's like puts the hammer down and says, now you're going to fix it, right? Or we're not going to use your thing. And they're like, oh, okay, sorry. We're cool. Uh, oh, here it is. It's in this email. Like anyone who says, oh, I didn't see the email, but you're like, here, 40 an email that I already sent you. They're like, oh, I didn't see it. Yeah, like sometimes, but like when the country of Brazil emails you to tell you that they're going to ban Telegram unless you do something, um, I don't think, I think it's kind of, I don't know, it's silly that they missed that uh, email. Anyways, so that's that ban is lifted. Let's check, let's keep on rolling. Pending and reading about conferences like Black Hat can be fun, which oh, okay. So there we go. That that's the news for today. Let's let's drop back into the chat real quick here. Get our music going. Okay, I did see a comment from a couple of people here about um, the Alexander asked, "Does the user get notified on the browser and the browser attack when they single sign on with the uh, the account?" Yes, that's quite possible. Okay, but there's a couple of things. One you may not have multi-factor on the account. So let, let's just play it for a second. You don't have multi-factor on the account. User types in their username and password. You don't need to log in right then, right? You just have compromised them. So maybe you wait until middle of the night, right? And then you you perpetrate your crime uh, and you do whatever you're going to do. Change the password, lock the user out of the account, change, change the backup uh, email address to send um, password recovery information to, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, it may have that uh, detection alert for end users that are compromised, but it may also not matter, right? You may just know, like you'll have an email from Google saying, we noticed a strange login. And then the next one says like, I've changed your password. Like, so th there is that I'm speculating a bit. So, you know, bear with me guys, that's going to do it for today. Let me let me thank Barricade Cyber Solutions again for sponsoring the stream and filling in for me when I can't make it. Guys, this Thursday on Simply Cyber Live at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're actually welcoming Scott Grow. This guy is a VP of product at NetAbstraction, which is a cybersecurity vendor. Now, we on this channel commonly talk about like, practitioner stuff, right? We talk about what is it like to be a SOC analyst? What is it like to be a pen tester? What is it like to be a GRC, a CISO, threat intelligence engineer, whatever it is. We always talk about practitioner stuff. Well, there's an entire world of cybersecurity adjacent roles that are still in industry that some people don't think about. One of them is on the product side. And I know guys, you might be like, get off me vendor, like stop calling me, et cetera, et cetera. Listen, some product, some vendors, like you're going to need a SIM, right? You're going to need an EDR. So working with the product side of the house in order to help solve your problems is a big deal. Guys, this isn't like you go to Best Buy and buy semantic antivirus and like you just get what you get. With product, with product engineers and people like Scott, you can actually say, hey, listen, your product's great, but I wish it did this. And they can make that happen. They can engineer the product to be better for you. And obviously they're incentivized because they can sell the product better, right? So it this isn't about sales or anything like this. This is literally Scott coming on and talking about what it's like to work in product. I almost took an, a job myself as working with product and and Ultimately, it wasn't a good fit for me, but I want Scott to come on and talk about what that life looks like. What's that role look like? What is product management? How do you get involved? Is it a good fit for you? Because I love practicing cybersecurity, but I want everybody to break into cybersecurity. I want everybody to work in cybersecurity, whether it's directly practicing or it is adjacent, like Joe Hudson in cybersecurity recruiting or like Scott in product management. So join us Thursday at 4.30 p.m., Eastern Standard Time for Scott's 
um, live stream, Cybersecurity Product Life. It's going to be a day in the life. And you guys obviously uh, can be dropping questions in chat. We'll have a good time as always. Yep. Project management side, base nailed it too. The PM life guys, big, big time. Um, there's a lot to cybersecurity. That's why when people say I want to, hold on. When people say I want to work in cybersecurity, the obvious next thing is like, okay, what do you want to do? And people who are uninitiated or on the outside, just walking up to the, the, the cybersecurity storefront, looking through the window, they don't understand how to answer that question. And that, that's part of the reason why I want to do these type of interviews is to get that information out. Uh, thanks so much, Toby. Thanks, Aaron. Jess Bishop, it's great to see you. Yeah. I hope you guys are all enjoying that, um, that, that GRC course. And remember, it's worth seven CPEs. I have to update the certificate of completion to let people know that. But if you've completed it, get your seven CPEs. Guys, that is going to do it for March 22nd. First things first, I've got a, hold on, I've got a teleprompter. I got all sorts of stuff. Guys, that's going to do it. Thank you so much. And we will see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. sharp. Okay, guys, be good. Take care.